Hi. Good Labor Day, whatever it is. <laughs> A day of labor, which we celebrate by not working. Of course. <laughs> okay. I am. David will be joining us in a minute or two. He's on the phone, so. Okay. okay. All right. But we can start. Let's... Thank you. <laughs> it takes a minute anyways to find it. Right, right. Yeah, so there's actually this, we read this one last time, but there's a uh, it's very fundamental. I think I want to look at it again. This is in nine from the beginning. Um, okay. Yeah. You should know that the commands of the Torah and its prohibitions are about four things. Beliefs, actions, traits, and speech. Again, beliefs, um, we're going to translate as uh, things you're supposed to know, things you're supposed to do, character traits, and speech. Beliefs, what are you supposed to know? That he commanded us to know the unity of God. Um, to love God and to fear him. Now, why is loving God and fearing God in beliefs? Why is loving God and fearing God in beliefs or, or things you're supposed to know. We would think of those as typically as a separate category because those are not so much of the mind, but they're rag regular, they're emotions. But would Maimonides think that in order to love God, All you that emotion, do. you'd have to know him first? Or, no. No? No. Well, a pillow? Is he there? Yeah. yeah. What, what I would have rather said, bearing on, on Rabbi Wolf, is that the way you fulfill the commandment of loving God is through knowing him. The Rambam, but when the, like when the Rambam talks about it, we had it in, uh, we had the Rambam talking about it because he said, how do you love God? Let's just look at it for a second. Just have to find it.
Wait one second here. See if they cite the sources. It's just annoying when people write something, but they don't cite their sources. Um, All right, let's let's just look back here for a second in It is mandatory to love and fear this glorified and awe-inspiring God for it is said thou shalt love the Lord thy God as it is said, the Lord thy God, thou shalt fear. But how may one discover the way to love and fear of him when man will reflect concerning his works and his great and wonderful creatures and will behold through them his wonderful matchless and infinite wisdom. He will spontaneously be filled with love, praise, and exaltation and then become possessed of a great longing to know the great name. Even as David said, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And when he will think of these matters, he will be taken aback in a moment and stricken with awe and realize that he is an infinitesimal creature, humble and dark, standing with an insignificant and slight knowledge in the presence of all wise, as David said, for when I see thy heavens and the wonderful works of thy fingers, of what use is man that thou mayest remember him? And in harmony with all these matters, I elucidate great general principles of the works of the Lord of the universe so that they might serve as an opening for one who understands by which to love the name. As some sages said in the subject of love, out of it thou wilt recognize the one who spoke and the universe was called into existence. So it does seem, and this is probably, this might be what David was saying, that you're, there is a role to play for knowing, but they aren't knowing. In other words, the, when, you, when you contemplate and reflect, they are a kind of pathway to love and awe, right? It, it says, when he reflects concerning his works, behold them. So he's reflecting and beholding the wisdom. Then he becomes spontaneously filled with love. And, and then he's going to uh, be filled with awe also. But at that love and awe also inspire you to know him. So they definitely are intertwined with knowing but they themselves, would you call them knowing? It, it, it. In other words, they're not, I guess they, they are very much connected to knowing. But it's, but okay. But let's say that you say like the rock, how can you command someone to love? Well, you say, well, if you do this knowledge, then it'll spontaneously come. It'll supervene on it. It'll, it'll be a causal relationship. Something will automatically happen. That's the only way you can get there. So they're just, you're they're saying just, they're, not, they're not necessarily the same thing, same. but they are connected. 
the one could not exist without the other. Right. That does look like they definitely need each other. Because not only is our awe and love the result of contemplation and beholding, but they themselves give rise to a thirst to know. My soul thirsts for God. You feel it with love, praise, and exodus, and become possessed of a great longing to know the great name. So not only are they born of contemplation, but they are also, also knowing, because contemplation is not necessarily study. I mean, I guess there's different types of study. That's what you have to say. There's, there's the kind of study that's analysis. There is observation. This is more like observation. This is observation. But, but observation is a very important part of study. It's like the beginning right. of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I see that difference, just meditating and observing. Okay. So, of course, I'm going to play the devil or Satan or something. Couldn't observing the works also bring you to know the non goodness of God? I mean, looking at the world and earthquakes and disasters and every i mean you're only supposed to look at the beauty well i think what somebody might say is they are also there this path if if you're going to be open and aware and observant is going to take you to those things as well somehow those things also can bring you to love and awe, but it, 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 it may take um, a kind of wiser uh, approach, but, but even those things will, will, will ultimately take you there. Yeah, because there's no possibility that you're not going to come across those things as well. The sadder but wiser. <laughs> or, or, or just... Uh, you know, like there's this Japanese uh, aesthetic called Wabi Sabi, W-A-B-I-S-A-B-I, -A -B -I, which is that you can't have beauty without um, imperfections. So it, and that there's a kind of, to some degree, a celebration of imperfections, like the wrinkles in a, in an older face. So um, the they you know if you if you they are a part of the beauty of age you know they sort of revere aged uh things things or the things that represent age uh that suggest age and um and the imperfections are absolutely essential like the people who also like listening to lps they they you'll hear them bemoan the clean, the completely pristine presentation of digital music, that they, that they feel that it's not somehow multidimensional without the imperfections that are in the LP or analog or whatever, that, that there's something um, lost with uh, plastic surgery or something that there, there's some that there's something missing when you try to smooth out um, the imperfections, even like on Antiques Roadshow, <laughs> you know, and the the worst cases are these people that have furniture that they have refinished, and they bring it like. <laughs> to one of these antique roadshow places. And there's an expert who tells them that if they would have left it with the original stain, it would be worth $100,000, but now it's worth $10,000 because they decided to have it yes. refinished. Yes. That kind of, so there's this ethic, this kind of aesthetic 
of Wabi Sabi. So I, I think they may say something like that. Taoists, Taoist Jews <laughs> would say that you without the bad, you can't have the good. In other words, you can't you can't have one without the other. You, you, you can't understand one without the other. The Maharal, who uh, was obviously, he represents the Taoist Jewish uh, group that you can't understand darkness without light. You can't understand light without darkness. If you wanna understand redemption, you have to understand exile. So those would be the way those people would go, I think, that they would still consider it they would consider it absolutely essential that your mind observed those imperfect, what appear to be imperfections, you know, together with the other stuff, something like that. Yeah, so uh, apparently in, when we get to this in the Sefer Mitzvos, he's not gonna say, he's gonna say you get to it through Talmud study, through Torah, not Talmud study, through Torah study. Let's see if we find it. Um, we have to go back to. I just want to look to see if we. Uh, here. So this is mitzvah number three. He says, that is that he commanded us about loving him may he be exalted and that is that we think about and contemplate his commandments his statements and his actions until we comprehend him and derive the greatest pleasure from that comprehension and that is the love that is obligated and the language of the sifre since it is stated and you shall love i would not know how a man is to love the omnipresence hence we Learn to say, and these things that I command you today shall be upon your heart, that through this you will recognize the one that spoke and the world came into being. Behold, we have explained to you that comprehension will come to you through contemplation, and you will then come to pleasure, and perforce the love will come. So here it doesn't include nature. He's not including nature. It's just talking about... Um, you know, through the words of Torah, but he does, he, here he does say it. He says, comprehension will come to you through, con so you have to contemplate, then comprehend, and then you will have love. Pleasure will come and love will come. And we have already clarified that this commandment also includes that we call all people to his service may be exalted to believe in him. So this is, uh, well, we're going to come back to this, but this is what the Rambam, like if you ask somebody, um, Jewish outreach, <laughs> what is the mitzvah in Jewish outreach? So a lot of people point to this, uh, as Hashem Lekecha, they shall love the Lord your God. Um, okay, let us go. Um, okay, so that is what he means when he says that it's part of beliefs or knowing. He commanded us uh, to believe in the unity of God, to love God and to fear him. And he prohibited us from many beliefs, such as his prohibiting us from any divinity besides him. Um, and he also commanded us in certain actions, such as the commanding us to bring sacrifices and the building of the temple and prohibited us from certain actions, such as his prohibiting us from sacrificing to anyone besides him, may he be blessed, or from bowing down to anything that is worship besides him. He also commanded us to act with a certain trait, like that which he commanded us about compassion, mercy, charity, and kindness, his saying, you shall love your neighbor like yourself. And so, yeah, so that's that thing that, uh, I mentioned last time about our, we've had this conversation about 
So this would seem to be a disagreement between the Ramban and the Rambam, because the, according to the Ramban, according to Nachmanides, the mitzvah is to act as a person who loves other people. But the notion that you would be commanded to love somebody like yourself, that's, um, he's saying, the Ramban was saying that that is not the mitzvah. The mitzvah is to act like somebody who loves um, other people. But the Rambam is clearly saying over here, we are com commanded to have love. Because uh, and that and that's a category of mitzvahs: mercy, charity, kindness, etc. You shall love your neighbor like yourself. And he prohibited us from acting with certain traits, like that which he prohibited us from hatred. Now he does say acting with the trait, acting with the trait, as opposed to saying having the trait. In the first so one, more like the, the Ramban. Right, but, he, but in the first one with the love, he didn't say that. In the, he said, oh no, he did. He said he commanded us to act with a certain trait. So this is where you'd like to see the Arabic, I think. Because what does he mean? He commanded us to act, but here it says with a certain trait, like that which he commanded us about compassion. You shall love your neighbor. So there it sounds like he wants us to feel the love. He permitted us from acting no, he's saying, he does say with certain traits again. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe this does need the Arabic though, because it is a subtle thing. You, one word here in this translation, let's see in the Hebrew. You know, one thing, essentially, you know, Rabban had the same uh, philosophy of ethics that Aristotle did, that everything was perfection of the character traits. Right. So it's going to have to be, for him to be a good action, it's going to have to be done the way a good person would do it. So it has to be done. With, it's not right. that you have to do it, but you have to do it the way that a good person it, would do it. Is it possible to act as a good person would without feeling what the good person does at the time? So that would be interesting. You know what? Maybe maybe somebody would say that if you're if you're not feeling it, then people can tell. I don't know, fake it to you, make it. I don't know. Uh, let's see here. He says in the Hebrew they say to act like hanhaga to act. It really does say lehis naheg, now here in the negative one he says you're not supposed to have hatred you're not you're not supposed to you know, want revenge or Jealousy. Right, he doesn't just say here acting. He says he warned us about the Mida. See, he doesn't. In the, again, this is the Hebrew and the English, and it would be better if we knew Arabic, but we don't. But I would say, I would say it looks like the Rambam doesn't agree. And, and, and David, you're just suggesting that it might make sense that the Rambam doesn't agree. In other words, you're not, you don't have the perfection of, of uh, let's say, tzedakah if you don't feel empathy and compassion. It's just not perfect. Is that what you were saying? Basically, yes. From, yeah. Because in order to get moral perfection, you have to get, it's all by, the act of it. That's all by perfection of the mitos. But are you fulfilling the mitzvah without the feeling? Are you fulfilling the mitzvah without the feeling? The, the, I guess the assumption is that if you're really doing it, you couldn't do it the way a good person did unless you have the feeling. That seems to be like a necessary condition for acting as a good man. Yeah, without, yeah, but the but 
giving tzedakah. I mean, you're fulfilling the mitzvah. Yeah, but, yeah. All right. And it's it's a lot. Yeah. 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 So that would be this. Okay. Um, if you're going to come to love your fellow man the way, in the same mode that you've come to love God, I don't think you could. <laughs> you couldn't observe your fellow man with awe. And do you see what I mean? <laughs> maybe I don't know. Maybe if you were open to the wonder and complexities of the human being, and yes, yeah, you might you could as, as you, a category yeah. of human. Yeah. But okay, yeah. I don't know, and then you'd have to. I don't know. You, you might be able to get there, but I could see it being very difficult. Um, uh, and he commanded us that we should say certain statements like that, which he commanded us to praise him, to pray to him, to confess our iniquities and our sins. So this is the speech part which is similar to this, as will be explained. It's just interesting what he chooses to cite as examples. And he prohibited us from certain speech like that, which he commanded and forbade us from swearing falsely, tail bearing, evil speech, cursing, and that which is similar to it. And once these matters uh, that we've been commanded about or prohibited from have come to us, whether they be action speech, uh, perspectives or traits, We do not look at the amount of times we are commanded it. If it is a command or that we're prohibited from it, if it is a prohibition for they are all to strengthen it. So the fact that it's said over and over doesn't mean they are separate commandments. As sometimes it comes back to the very same matter with run prohibition after the other to reinforce it. it. So just because it's mentioned more than once doesn't mean that it has more than one detail, in other, that it's more than one mitzvah. And likewise, so yeah, then what do you do about the fact that there's nothing extra in the Torah? I think Lois brought this up or something last time. Um, so um, he seems to be open to the idea that sometimes there isn't something new to be learned except how much this matters. Maybe that is something new. The fact that God has to repeat it is an indication that it, it matters even more than you would imagine, that you thought before. Maybe that's called adding an element. And likewise, will one command come after the other to reinforce a single commandment? This is unless you find some statement of the sages to differentiate the matter, such as the commentators, meaning to say the sages of the Talmud explain to you the positive commandment in it or the negative commandment in it that is not included in the previous parallel positive or negative commandment. So your first thought is, it could be there's something different and therefore this is a different commandment. It could be there's not. And so you'd have to look through the Talmud and the Midrash in order to see if they in fact find something new there, then there is a new mitzvah, and if they don't, it's just reinforcement. For then it would be appropriate to count it as a separate commandment without a doubt, as it would not still just be reinforcement, but rather additional content, even though that appears from script, what appears from scripture is that it's about the same content. For we are only forced to say that a verse is repeated to enforce it and is not new content if we don't come across the statement of the commentators who are the receivers of the tradition otherwise. However, when we find that the tradition says that this command or this prohibition has such content and this command or prohibition that is repeated as different content, this understanding has priority and is better such that the verse not be repeating, but rather containing additional content. And then it would be appropriate to count this one by itself and that one by itself. Nevertheless, when there is no new content there, you should know that it is only truly being repeated to reinforce it. And in order that it be known that this matter is a very great, a great iniquity, given that one prohibition after another is coming about it, or to learn a law about the commandment or to learn that it, one of the laws of another commandment, 
This is, as it explained in the Talmud, it is statement exported for a verbal analogy or to learn from it a parallel. And behold, we saw that they say P.S. Bob be upon them alluded to this matter in the Gemara in the second chapter of Psachim. And this is what they intended about one of the negative commandments that appeared to be repeated since the prohibition already came from another verse and they sought to establish it to be about additional content. So they'll say, why do we need both verses? Didn't we already cover it in this one? And then they'll tell us, well, it's because they needed us to know something else. And it was said about it as a difficulty. Ravina said to Ravashi, and say that it comes to have one violate two negative commandments for the same act. So maybe it's not coming to tell you something new is forbidden. Maybe the reason it's coming to tell you is to, it repeats it is because it wants you to be liable twice for the same thing. This is meaning to say that which you want to establish this negative statement about a different matter than the matter that came as a result of the other negative statement, what is your need to toil about this? Perhaps it is repeated about the exact same matter in order that the person who does this matter be liable for two negative commandments. So he seems to be suggesting that. In other words, there's no new, maybe there's no new information here. It's just telling us how severe it is that God wants us to be punished twice for it. But the answer was, he said to him, anywhere that it's possible to expound, we expound. And we do not establish the verses containing an extra negative commandment for the same act. So he's saying, if we have a chance to find some new law, then we do that. Otherwise, we will say like you're saying, but if we have a chance to find some new law, we're motivated to do that. So, so they are motivated to find another law when it's repeated. But if they don't, then it's being repeated for emphasis. Behold, it has been clarified to you that any negative statement that is not coming for additional content is surely called extra, that is to say that it is repeated. And even if they will say it comes to have one violate two negative commandments, behold, it's nevertheless an extra negative commandment, as is clear from this statement. Hence, it is inappropriate to count it. In other words, if, if what you're saying is that you're going to get two punishments for the same negative thing that still wouldn't be reason to count it as two separate things it's one thing it's just telling you that for this one thing you should get punished why would you say two different punishments instead of a stronger punishment because it's mentioned twice or three yeah, times i don't know in other words uh, so let's say it's lashes a lot of times the fallback is that it's malchus it's whip so they would just say you get twice the whipping instead right. you're saying maybe it shouldn't maybe if it says it twice you shouldn't get whipping you should get death penalty or something more no. yeah i don't know why well you couldn't do that let me ask yeah do we do we find other instances where people get double lashes yeah i mean you could have it for instance let's say uh um, like for instance, they'll they'll say that if you if you do a Kares level penalty, you get lashes. So there are times when you could do one act, and you get five different penalties. Uh, but usually, when that happens, you're getting one for different. You are getting it for different commandments. But like, oh, I'll give you another example. Let's say, let's say somebody, I think it would work this way. If somebody ate on purpose on Yom Kippur and then they forgot it was Yom Kippur, then they remembered it was Yom Kippur and then they ate again then they forgot it was Yom Kippur, and then they remembered it was Yom Kippur and ate again. It could be that you would get several, you, you, you would be liable for several lashes, even though you're essentially doing the same thing over and over. But there you're doing several separate acts. That's why you're getting several lashes. 
there are cases where we, we've had several times in the Gemara where we say you could do one thing and you're liable for five different penalties. Like let's say you plowed on Shabbos using two different types of animals, you know, that are colliding together. So you plowed on Shabbos during Shemitah using two different animals together. And you were wearing shotguns. <laughs> or, yeah, so they do talk about something like that. In other words, <laughs> then they say, is, is that really, <clears throat> or let's say you're eating, you know, something that's not kosher at the time. But here, at least, it's one act of plowing. <clears throat> and the one act of plowing is several violations. Right, but they have those. I think we had it even where you're wearing something. And then it wasn't clear if that should be counted as one act, <coughs> two acts. But the but the the ones, let's say it's during a Shemitah year on Shabbos, you're plowing using two different kinds of animals. Um, so that's really one act. And but you've done three different crimes with the one act. The question is, like for instance, it says you cannot eat. Um, shratzim, you cannot eat or like a fly. I think a fly is subject to several different penalties. Are you liable for several different lashes because you ate a fly? That one I don't remember. I know it comes up. The, 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 there's certain things that are mentioned several times. Um, I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. <laughs> now we know what the question was. It was much more profound than we thought over there. It so, seems that the yeah. Rambam is doing two things here. He's trying to find broader categories of those things, speech, action, you know, the four things he started with. And he's trying to find the specifics within those, you know, he's doing, I guess, those two things. Right. It's also just sort of interesting what he's picking, like for actions, he picks sacrifices and, you know, build, right. you right. know, building a base of Mikdash or whatever. It's like, uh, hmm. yeah, why, why is he picking those for actions? So many actions he could have picked. And yeah, so it leads you to wonder if there isn't some thing that is going on underneath the text. Um, okay, behold, it is already clear that the commandments are not multiplied by the multiplicity of positive or negative statements about the same content. It could be that that means that there is more, but not always. Sometimes it's just repeating for emphasis. Okay, so next time we'll come back to this. Wait. Isn't it curious that if it had been the Rambam or Rashi who had repeated something, we would say, obviously, they meant to teach something in this repetition that they didn't mean to teach in the last. We would take that as being, you know, not even worth discussion, but when it's in the Torah, they have poetic license. Well, he does <laughs> He does say, if you can, I mean, he was quoting the Gemara, who is it, Ravashi, who said, if you can find something, then you should. Because that seemed to be the thing. Ravina was saying, why don't you always just say, it's coming to tell you you're liable for more. And he said, no, if you can find something, you should. Yeah, so according to the Ravina, Right. Rambam but I was saying, the, Rambam, the Rambam was quoting that. You know. Yeah, but it, if we were studying the Rambam, we, we'd assume that the Rambam had a reason for stating it twice. Right. It's just, it, it's not a deep point. It's, it's just like chuck, chuckle, chuckle. Well, I'm just saying, Ravashi probably would say the same thing about, about the Torah. And okay, we assume it, but if you can't find it, then what are you supposed to do? But it's, it, it's very possible that that's what Ravash meant, that we assume it, that we do ah. assume that, ah. that it's there. But, but the question is, what if you don't, what if you don't find it? Because yeah, why are yeah. you saying, why, do you, why are you looking? 
you could say to them, why are you looking? Yeah. If you don't assume that there's something else there, obviously. So let's see the exact language what you said. This one is a quote from the Gemara. So they should get it right here in the Hebrew. No, he just said he doesn't say who says who in the in the Hebrew. He doesn't say who says who, but here he did, didn't he? I thought he I thought he said who said. I thought it was Ravashi and Ravina. I can't even see the screen. Here it was. Yeah, Ravina and Ravashi. Ravina said to Ravashi, and say it comes to just to say it's to tell you there's two negative commandments for one act. And he said to him, anywhere that it's possible to expound, we expound. Yeah, so maybe that's what he's saying. We assume there has to be something here. If it's possible to expound, we do do it. It's just if you can't, then you're left to say. It's extra. Mm -hmm. All righty. Okay. Thank you very, very, very Thank much. You. You're, you're very, very welcome. You're welcome. Bye-bye.